The I Quit Social Media YouTube videos have become a classic, and their upload frequency continues to rise. Still, viewers who wish they could get themselves to try the same reopen the next app in their cycle. And still, those who made the videos in the first place just end up re-downloading all of the apps. While this happens because there are undeniable benefits of social media that cannot be achieved elsewhere, this dynamic is a sign of a severe problem, especially for the first generation to truly grow up with these platforms. Uh, our kids have become uh, less connected humanly to each other, and this is kind of a new phenomenon. Research shows 95% of teens are on social media. More than a third say they're on constantly. 2012 happens to be the first year the majority of Americans owned a smartphone. It's also around the time that social media use moved from relatively optional to virtually mandatory among teens. In fifth grade, literally every single one of my classmates had a phone at that time. We have a mass exodus of teachers leaving the profession because of parents and student behavior. These kids are addicted to screens. They're addicted. Study after study shows that kids um, three to five that spend more than two hours on a screen have significantly more physical aggression, hyperactivity, and not following directions or rules or anything like that. Why, why is mental health declining mm -hmm. across the board? Mm -hmm. Why are we unhealthy, you right. know, in a way that we weren't before, yeah. or in different ways, right. shall I say. Mm -hmm. What's going on? This is not an across the board increase in all kinds of mental health problems. It's specific to anxiety and depression and the behaviors that go along with them. The suicide rate for young people has begun to skyrocket. The suicide rate for 10 to 14 year olds has doubled. For young girls, it has quadrupled. They started spending more time online, less time sleeping, less time with friends face to face. That is a terrible formula for mental health. I think once all of the data comes back, we're going to really view this last decade as the dopamine generation, the way we view our parents' decade as the nicotine generation. And so I think we're going to really transform social media and put limits and guardrails. And that's actually something that I look forward to. I don't know if there's a way to be on social media without getting addicted. I'm navigating this at 50 when my mind has already been developed. Mm -hmm. What chance do kids have developing through this time period? We're living in the middle of a youth mental health crisis in America, and I've said before this is the defining public health issue of our time. Social media is its own world. For the last 25 years, there have been no federal laws passed regarding the relationship between kids, teens, and social media. The last time one was passed was in 1998 before the birth of today's most popular platforms. That law is actually the reason that most companies have 13 years old as the age that a user can create an account for themselves. Because for those under the age of 13, the law requires parental consent before websites can collect personal information. Though we know that's easy to get around and that these companies have also created kid versions of their platforms. But there's been a dramatic shift in the last year, with at least 10 federal bills proposed, while 35 states have pending legislation and 11 states have already passed bills. Some are great and some are not. While it's important for this topic to gain steam, it's also important to note that. We, can't, we need younger people that actually understand how these platforms can be weaponized to write the laws about the internet. I do think that the only thing worse than no laws is bad laws, um, because bad legislation can really end up being used for nefarious purposes, and they can often, it's, you know, it's like how, it can be used to target and punish the very people that are sort of the victims of this system. But I think we need a lot more regulation around online safety, and I think ultimately we need more user control over our own experiences of these platforms. To understand the nuances of why social media legislation is important, I sat down with two other digital natives who are holding tech companies accountable. I would love for you to introduce yourself and what work you're focused on right now. My name is Zaman Qureshi. I co-chair the Design It For Us Coalition and I work on policy for the Real Facebook Oversight Board. Tech moves a million miles a minute and, and Congress does not. And we, as digital citizens, deserve the rights that we ask for when we're online. And that includes privacy, accountability, and power as, as users. And I'm just really interested in finding ways to rein in big tech's power, protect kids and teens online, and make online platforms safer. We have to keep in mind that young people aren't going away from these platforms, and so we need to build these platforms and regulate these platforms to be better, because there is a social price, as we wrote in our article, 
to leaving these platforms. People can be ostracized, as Frances Haugen said, for leaving Instagram. My name is Emma Lemke. I am the founder and executive director of the Wall Golf Movement. I'm the co-chair of Design It For Us and that coalition. Social media is not all bad. Members of my generation understand it to be a multifaceted entity, one where we can connect with each other, we can explore our identities, and we can express ourselves on a new dimension. And I'm currently focused on investigating the intersection between well-being, youth engagement, and technology, and specifically looking at how technology can be used to amplify our humanity while not corroding it. What these companies are doing is no matter the age, no matter how old the user is, they are going to try to maximize that attention to maximize profit, when in reality what it's causing is this fueling of the youth mental health crisis that we face today. As mentioned, they are the co-chairs of Design It For Us, a coalition of digital natives aimed at transforming the social media landscape for kids and teens by targeting the design, the features of these platforms. Members of the coalition have been uplifted in the New York Times, Washington Post, Time Magazine, and more for their work. Design It For Us was a part of getting state legislation passed. This fall, California passed the California Age Appropriate Design Code Act landmark legislation that requires online platforms to build in safeguards to mitigate risks for all users who are under 18. That law will take effect in 2024. As well as played a role in getting federal legislation to a Senate floor vote, which will be scheduled this fall. Senators will debate legislation to protect kids' privacy online, which I've been calling for for two years. It matters. Pass it, pass it, pass it, pass it. Pass it. <laughs> I really mean to think about it. They believe that this era of self-regulation doesn't cut it and that both state, but mostly federal legislation is necessary for future generations to have a net positive relationship with the digital world. And just so you understand how they're like assessing these different proposals. On a federal level, Design It For Us currently supports two bills, the Kids Online Safety Act, AKA COSA, which will require platforms to enable the strongest privacy and safety settings by default, provide minors with options to disable addictive features, opt out of algorithmic recommendations and protect their information, as well as mitigate content that promotes suicidal behaviors, eating disorders, and more. Second, the sequel to the 1998 Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, aka COPPA, which would strengthen certain protections related to the online collection, use, and disclosure of personal information of children and minors up to age 16 instead of just 13 now. No, this would not up the age for when minors could create an account for themselves. While there are bills proposed that are trying to up the age of when kids are allowed to be on social media to 16, like flat out a complete block, Design It For Us specifically supports these two bills because it puts pressure on social media companies to change the actual environment that minors are logging into. They have opposed federal bills like the Protecting Kids Online Act, which aside from prohibiting the recommendation of harmful content, gives parents tools to control their child's account and requires a new level of parental consent. They oppose this bill because they believe it does not address the fundamental design issues of these platforms and instead puts more responsibility on parents, which also creates more policing and surveillance over minors. On a state level, Design It For Us has supported the age-appropriate design code bill passed in one state and introduced in various others, which target more control over privacy settings, lessening algorithmic manipulation, the ability to opt out of things like targeted advertising, preventing harmful content, and the inability to collect minors' data without parental consent. Again, focused on platform design. They oppose recent state bills that passed in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Utah going to effect in 2024, all of which require both age verification and parental consent for those under 18 which they believe, again, do not target the design issues at hand and instead potentially cause parental surveillance and social ostracization. This was a very general overview, but there are links to all of these bills in the description to learn more and form your own opinions. Again, this is arguably the issue of our time. Let's get into it. It's subjective, but I think the notion that those who are older or wiser is, you know, logical in a lot of context or time on this earth tends to correlate with mm -hmm. more experiences, more learnings. Um, but I find social media to be really unique. And while traditionally people still in school, people in their 20s and even 30s have kind of been pushed to pay their dues, you know, have years within the workforce before they have more weight behind their words, why do you think it's important to not apply that mentality to this topic? There is an inversion. The mm -hmm. experts in the space are digital natives. And I think it is true to your point that as you 
you know, grow up, it's like a blank slate. You gain more experiences. You can test yourself, learn more about the world. And through that, you can better develop your opinions. But older generations will never be able to experience what it is like to grow up during such an important developmental phase and to have Instagram in your back pocket. It's a weird world because it didn't exist previous. Like It's not like we're dealing with something that we went through when we were children. Mm -hmm. There was no Google when we were children. Very rarely do you have one of these generational shifts where uh, the, the generation that leads, like parents who, 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 who guide their children, have such um, a different set of experiences that they don't have the context to support their children in a safe way. I got social media accounts at the age of 12. Um, I distinctly remember all of my friends around me slowly getting it and being the last in the friend group. My daughter is five. She's in preschool. Mm -hmm. And she came home a couple of weeks ago and asked my wife and me if she could post a picture on social media. She doesn't even have a social media account. We've never talked to her about social media, yet all of her friends are talking about this. Eventually, that magic that I had entered into the app and felt as though I had experienced wore off. And what was left was just this mirage um, where I was left quantifying my worth through likes, comments and followers, scrolling mindlessly for five to six hours a day and not understanding what was pulling me in. Um, and that led to depression, increased anxiety, and issues related to eating. The algorithms are very smart in the sense that they latch on to things that people want to continue to engage with. And unfortunately, in the case of teen girls and things like self-harm, they develop these feedback cycles where children are using Instagram as to self-soothe, but then are exposed to more and more content that makes them hate themselves. And I finally reached a breaking point when I reached for my phone like a Pallovian response. And when I grabbed it, I finally asked, what on earth am I doing? Why have I lost control? And what features and mechanisms are at play that have resulted in this? I wouldn't say it's like an addiction, but um, it'll be something that like brings you joy. But then when you don't find anything on it, you'll still want to look for things that'll make you happy. And I feel like at one point you were addicted to TikTok. Yeah. Do you think you were? Definitely. <laughs> There's no doubt. When you reflect on the past decade of social media in regards to policy and or business practices, what stands out to you most? We sort of had this very rosy view of what the tech industry looked like you know, 10, 15 years ago. And Silicon Valley were these cool guys in hoodies who coded <laughs> and they were going to revolutionize the world. Um, they have revolutionized the world, but that has come at a tremendous cost. Depression, suicide, loneliness, the generation with access to the most information seems to be struggling in ways perhaps our generations did not. Kentucky 96 lingers over this video containing the hashtag depression. Something's wrong with me. And these videos about suffering from anxiety. It's like a reward. After 224 videos into the bot's me. overall journey, or about 36 minutes of total watch time, TikTok's understanding of Kentucky 96 takes shape. Videos about depression and mental health struggles outnumber those about relationships and breakups. From here on, Kentucky 96's feed is a deluge of depressive content. 93% of videos shown to the account are about sadness or depression. Gen Z has been particularly impacted by this because of the ways that these technologies have put profits over safety. And by that, I mean decisions are being made at companies to prioritize engagement, to prioritize eyeballs scrolling on the screen, to prioritize um, constantly being on, because that's what drives profit. We made changes to our newsfeed to allow for more meaningful interactions knowing that that would impact the time spent. In fact, it did impact the time spent by about 50 million hours per day, but we did it anyway because we were trying to build a positive, more positive experience. We do want to be leading in terms of uh, safety of our users, particularly for teenagers. We were the first to launch a 60-minute watch limit. Yeah, let's I'm, talk about the 60-minute launch. And I'm very glad to see then. people, uh, others in our industry follow. My understanding is that teens can pretty easily bypass the notification to continue using the app if they want to. I mean, 
let's face it, our, our teens are smarter than we are by half. And they know how to use the technology and they can get around these limits if they want to. And it's, it's disheartening because you have these trust and safety people who work inside tech who have, who were brought in with an ethic, ethical and moral compass to deliver ideas around how to make these platforms safer. And you know, we've spoken to some of these people before who care about the well-being of the recipients of the content that people are accessing on their platform, but they don't get the final say in these conversations. It's those CEOs and executives and the boards of these companies that ultimately continue to allow the profit-based surveillance capitalism model mm-hmm. to com- continue to perpetuate. And that, I think, has been the most surprising to me is that in other industries, when we have safety flaws or defects that could potentially harm a, a huge amount of people in a country or around the world, typically we do something to address it. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes you know you have to put out more research and garner support around it. But we've been doing this now for years. This generation of children will grow up under a level of surveillance well beyond any previous one. Children were also struggling before the pandemic, bullying, violence, trauma, and the harms of social media. As Frances Haugen, who is here tonight with us, has shown, we must hold social media platforms accountable for the national experiment they're conducting on our children for profit. An argument that often comes up is that it is the parent's job to regulate their children's relationship with social media, not the government's. What do you think of this sentiment? I think it quite frankly is bullshit um, because the onus should not be put on the parent or the individual to, to not become like addicted and to be pulled into these spirals and these echo chambers. They find themselves as pitted against some of the best product designers in the world who have designed these platforms to maximize the amount of time that kids spend on these platforms. Who keep coming up with new ways to get teenagers addicted. So I think to punt off that responsibility and to place the accountability on the parent is a huge burden that that no individual can can carry, nor should they. Not every parent has that time or the digital lexicon to be able to figure out whether this is a platform that they should be allowing their kid on or not. Close parental supervision with a substantial education coming from the school. Here's a news flash for you. A lot of parents don't care, doctor. My my 10-year-old knows more about this phone than I know about it already. What's going to be like in another four years or five or six years like your son? It's very hard for parents to try to police the hours. It, it, totally. Almost impossible. I don't want more tools. I want to <laughs> stop having to dive in front of the phone that my children can't get away from. Parents only let their kids have Instagram because the kid says everyone else has it. We're, and that's, we're stuck in a social dilemma. We're stuck in a trap. What can we do? Because we are also filled with anxiety. Mm-hmm. What we really look to do is strategically, you know, how can we provide resources to parents to better understand how to engage in conversations with their young person, to provide resources to individuals to build better screen time habits. But we want to emphasize that that should not be on the parent or the individual. That should be on tech companies to innovate in a way that is humane and that centers and prioritizes the user and considers and accounts for their well-being in the development of their product and service. I've seen one or maybe both of you mention that these platforms were built by adults for adults. Mm-hmm. And I kind of want to push back on that a bit because, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was only 19 when he founded Facebook. Um, Evan Spiegel was only 22 when he founded Snapchat. So, you know, legally adults, but still wildly young, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> um, and I don't know that any age group is immune or any age group necessarily has that much more agency over the negative effects that these platforms currently have, especially in regard to addictive design. I would even argue that maybe a decent percent of kids' screen time is due to the parents having screen time issues. So they're just like, I don't want to be bothered. You you get on the iPad, you get on the phone, whatever, do whatever you want on social media. We made a rule, you know, about an hour before bed, phones down. Well, her very first thing she said to me was, well, you don't do that. <laughs> but why do you feel that legislation should be geared towards kids and teens? to some extent. Yeah, given that now Zuckerberg is a father, now Mm -hmm. he puts Mm -hmm. emojis over his kids' faces when he posts them, that he doesn't let Mm -hmm. his kids use 
uh, social media, or will only allow them to go on like Messenger Kids, I think, for half an hour.、Mm. That is the reality that him as a father lives in, but as a CEO, will not take action based off of. And so I think that's where we continue to find ourselves: is those CEOs and executives that have have had opportunities to course correct, have had opportunities to take a step back and see the bigger picture. Um, and maybe they have, but their decision making absolutely does not show that. And so that's where legislation and regulation and the outside ability to restrict a technology company from a gobbling up all of its competition、uh, and building a monopoly, or b、um, harming kids and teens. I think that's where、um, that's where the most can be done. As a dad,、uh, do you worry about social media addiction as a problem for America's teens? Well, my hope is is that we can be idealistic, but have a broad view of our responsibility.、Uh, to your your point about teens, this is certainly something that I think any parent thinks about: is how much do you want your kids using technology? It, it, at Facebook specifically,、uh, I view our responsibility as not just building services that people like. But building services that are good for people and good for society as well. So we study a lot of effects of well-being of our of our tools and broader technology. And you know, like any tool,、um, there are good and, and bad uses of it. An external survey just last month suggested that more teens are using TikTok and YouTube than Instagram. This is an industry-wide challenge and requires industry-wide solutions and industry-wide standards. Despite it being a completely new reality on top of the one we sit in, there are very few legislative frameworks, as you had mentioned earlier. Many people are hesitant towards that changing because they worry that it is going to mess with a sense of freedom that we currently have in online spaces. How do you look at those sentiments in relation to your work? Yeah, I'm more concerned about the status quo、mm -hmm. of us continuing to exist like this. In the trajectory in which we're going, the alternative is self-regulation.、Mm -hmm. Is that tech companies are going to say, "Well, we're going to trust us. We're, we've got this. We're going to figure this out. We're going to do this. We have the people to be able to do it." And that just—they haven't proven that they're going to be trustworthy partners in any of this.、Um, and that's where legislation and policy can. Fill that void. You think about cars. We don't tell a parent of a 15 or 16 year old who's about to start driving. You know what? You figure out whether the car is safe on your own. You figure out what、right. tools and 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 sort of safety provisions and features it needs. We establish safety standards and then we implement them and enforce them. That's what we need policymakers to do here. We have never sought a piece of legislation that tries to restrict access to the internet.、Mm -hmm. You know that we think that it's a Core fundamental value that we have the ability to connect with one another on these platforms. You look at cigarettes and you look at the oil industry, and there have been many instances in our past where negative externalities have popped up from products or services that have been offered to society, and eventually, you know, those harms have amounted to, you know, catalyze a public response where people have said, "Enough is enough. We are done." And I think we are getting to that point with social media, where individuals and generations, Gen Z and activists, are saying, "Enough is enough. We want freedom. We want to be able to express ourselves. But if we continue to move forward in a, this era of self-regulation, we're not going to be able to build a productive online space that will actually promote and sustain society and move humanity forward." It's Big Tobacco's playbook, all over again. The level of harm、uh, that. Ability to scientifically realize that there was measurable harm done.、Um, I think it's going to be something that a massive light bulb goes off, and I think it already is. And I think a lot of people are hesitant to express their curiosity or hesitant to express their support of possible social media legislation because they enjoy, if not love, much of their time on these platforms. And even though they maybe innately feel. That aspects of the relationship are, you know, deeply wrong. Something doesn't sit right with them. They stay silent. They tune out because they don't want to seem like they're contradicting themselves.、Mm -hmm. um, how do you encourage people to look at the nuances of this relationship? I've had this conversation with many young people where they have said, "Well, 
I believe that something needs to change, but I'm worried that if certain actors have the ability to instigate change, it's going to lead to a complete, you know, block. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the only way that I can push for social media regulation is through content moderation or through age restrictions. And what I've said to a lot of my friends is that's not the reality. This is the reality. What do you want to see from future technology? What's important to you? And usually they'll say, you know, it's connection, it's expression, it's being able to engage with a family friend at home. And then I say, well, what are you most troubled by? And they'll say, for a lot of my young female friends, um, the content I get as a young woman um, that's propagating and producing eating disorders. Um, it's extremist content language. It's filter bubbles. Um, it's suicidal ideation. And usually it's through discussing and unpacking, you know, where my friends and the individuals around me find that it's difficult to support social media. It's through that entry point that I can say, well, those are things that can be hyper fixated on we can address. A new poll just came out today that said 81% of teens want to see safety by design features on social media. The theory of change, I think, uh, has not been digestible for a lot of young people. It's been a wonky ivory tower DC mm -hmm. political conversation. And it's our role and our job to distill some of that for our generation and our cohort and say things like the Kids on Lane Safety Act are common sense regulations that are going to establish a duty of care that does not exist in this country right now. We want a baseline, I think, first yep. and foremost. And once we establish that baseline, then we can get into the nuance around crafting digital ecosystems and spaces to prioritize the things we want to see. But we need that that structure, that foundation first. You shouldn't feel like it's your fault when you feel so addicted to your phone because there's a massive asymmetry between the thousand people behind the screen and the supercomputers that are pointed at our brains to try to predict the perfect thing to get us to stay longer. Hopefully that's illuminating and clarifying to people and gives us back some agency. Like we do in the real world, we need to protect our kids in the virtual world. This is not a partisan issue. You became one of the first within our generation to testify in front of Congress regarding tech policy. What was your mindset going into that experience and what were your takeaways from those moments? I was very surprised that I was being invited to come and speak on behalf of Gen Z. I have heard as members of my generation have expressed concern, not just for our own well-being, but for younger siblings for cousins, and for all those to come after us. While our stories may differ, we share the frustration of being portrayed as passive victims of big tech. We are ready to be active agents of change, rebuilding new and safer online spaces for the next generation. 10 years from now, social media will not be what it is today. It will be what members of my generation build it to be. We want to build it differently. We want to build it right. So I was incredibly excited and grateful for that opportunity to help bridge the informational gap. Um, and then when the day had come, I was very impressed by the questions that were being asked. And not only the questions, but the care in which legislators, lawmakers, and policy um, analysts were taking in attacking how to address the issue. Um, I think individuals understand that there is no silver bullet, that there is no one approach that will work. Um, and I think that's represented in a lot of the work I do from the bottom up working to help build healthier relationships with tech from an individual level and from the top down working with policymakers. But I do understand and I really saw that day how many different approaches were being taken to enact change and how passionate individuals were about moving that dial. And I think a lot of the passion was stemmed from personal experience. I want to read uh, in that connection a text that just came to my staff and I haven't had the opportunity really to review it myself, but I'm going to read it. Uh, it comes from one of the families whose story I shared anonymously, quote, I've watched the entire hearing. I just heard the senator refer to our experience. Mr. Beckerman is lying that her experience is atypical. That is not 
through my daughter's TikTok feed was inundated with suicide ideation video videos, self-harm videos, and anorexia videos because she was feeling depressed and searched for videos on this topic. Then every time she opened the app, there was more. She could have been feeling better, but these videos brought her down again and inspired her to spend hours making her own similar videos. I also just want you to know that she is an honors student, athlete, president of her student council, an all around great kid. Mr. Beckerman's testimony makes me so angry. With the continuous integration of artificial intelligence on these platforms or otherwise, as well as the rise of virtual, augmented, and mixed reality platforms, how do you look at those topics in relation to what needs to get done within the current social media landscape? Yeah, so I think they're, they're very much intertwined. Mm -hmm. AI more generally has been used to power algorithms for these tech platforms for years. Mm -hmm. AI, artificial intelligence, is not new. We're, we've been living with it for a while now. Um, you know, it's anything as complicated as what trains your algorithm to, uh, when you're scrolling through TikTok, to what search results you get on Google. Um, and that, I think, it, that understanding can help us sort of think about how we tackle these issues. One of the major things that we've talked about moving forward with our policy work is, like, you can't, don't separate social mm -hmm. media and AI. Like, don't say that we need to, like, regulate AI and then we'll touch social media because to your point, social media involves AI and like we might be looking and we might need to look more critically, much more critically at, at elections and specifically the use of generative AI in kind of fundraising and in, in advertising. But we need to also tackle what does AI look like in a responsible way being employed within social media companies. And we, we shouldn't have to tackle both of those conversations separately. We can have a joint conversation about the need for accountability and the need for charting out new guidelines and common sense regulations surrounding AI, technology, social media as one. Well. You know, th this is a tool that a user is using to help generate content more efficiently than before. They can change it. They can test the accuracy of it. If they don't like it, they can get another version. Um, but it still then spreads through social media or other ways, like ChatGPT is a you know single player experience where, where you're just using this. Um, and so I think as we think about what to do, that's, that's important to understand. Congress thus far has demonstrably failed to responsibly enact meaningful regulation of social media companies with serious harms that have resulted that we don't fully understand. Senator Klobuchar referenced in her questioning uh, a bipartisan bill that would open up um, social media platforms, underlying algorithms. We have struggled to even do that, to understand the underlying technology and then to move towards responsible regulation. We cannot afford to be as late to responsibly regulating generative AI as we have been to social media because the consequences, both positive and negative, will exceed those of social media by orders of magnitude. China has been taking major steps to mitigate kids and teens media addiction, specifically on digital platforms. We're talking three things. First, some of the viewers may already be aware, but two years ago, the country instituted a strict three hour per week limit for children on video games, which is enforced through real name registration with a valid ID or facial recognition, helping to prevent kids from bypassing those limits with siblings or parents' accounts. The government was willing to give the gaming market a major hit, by the first quarter of 2023, China's leading company experienced a 96% decrease in gaming hours and a 90% decrease in gaming spending from those under 18. Second, Doyen, their TikTok equivalent, has had restrictions, people kind of know this, with the app not being accessible from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., daily usage being limited to 40 minutes per day, and the content skewing towards edutainment slash STEM. And lastly, third, this is new, they're doubling down and putting a comprehensive set of regulations on how children use all apps, which will be called Miner's Mode. The government will be working with three stakeholders, app developers, app store providers, as well as the makers of smart devices. For kids under eight, they will only be able to use smartphones for 40 minutes per day, and any content consumed will be related to education, hobbies and interests, or liberal arts. 
Once they turn 8, they graduate to 60 minutes of screen time, and there will also be entertainment content with positive guidance. The European Union, which includes 27 countries, has been continuously looked at as ahead of others in legislating the social media landscape, but even their decisions don't yet get into this territory. What do you think U.S. government officials, for better or worse, have to learn from what China's doing? There's just been such an anti-China sentiment Mm. from this government that on both sides of the aisle. I'm sure there are lessons to take from what they're doing. And I think it is telling as well that, you know, the government of China is so concerned about the impacts of social media on its younger users. I mean, I have no doubt that I'm sure they look at U.S. kids, American kids, and go, that's not a reality that we want to create Mm -hmm. for ourselves. The idea that you should shut down social media from like 10 to 6 a.m. I'm not saying that's what we need to do. I understand logistically, like I am very happy that we are in a an environment in a country that does prioritize like freedom and like for those individuals that need community online, like you, you don't want to put up enormous barriers. You want to make the online world safer when you decide to enter it. But all I'm saying is sleep is an incredibly important thing for your own development for your personal well-being and for like for a mental health crisis to me it makes a lot of sense too that we would want to reprioritize the need for recovery and sleep like ask any um ask any individual who works in psychology or neuroscience sleep is incredibly important and i know i spent a large portion of my years heavily addicted at like 2 a.m scrolling so it's like my question is how can we also as a society prioritize like setting out that time. How can we reprioritize being a human being and like making sure that our fundamental needs are met first to then use social media as a tool rather than it using us? Because right now, if we can't put down our screens, if a young person is so addicted and feels like they have to be on at all times, that's phones and that's big tech companies using us. We truly are the product at that point. And I do think that we are in a country and we are in a society that really emphasizes being your own person, having personal agency, determining your future. And how is it that we can live in that mentality, but also in a situation where we are not determining our future, we're not determining our time because our attention is consistently being taken away from us. I think we need to, as a society, really think critically about like reprioritizing what is most important to us, needing to meet our needs. And then I think we can have a conversation then about if, if these are our needs and our objective, connection, expression, exploration, finding communities, let's take the online world and really make sure that those are portions that are protected and really work critically to chip away at at harmful negative externalities. Instagram and TikTok are raising our children. Our children are spending more time with them than they are talking to us, and those platforms channel the enormous force of peer pressure and peer norms onto them. Just like so long as a whale's worth more dead than alive and a tree is worth more as lumber than as a tree, in this model on technology, social media today, we're worth more when we're addicted, distracted, outraged, polarized, and disinformed, because that means that we have been successfully influenced to use these products and to be successful for advertisers. With more parents starting to prominently feature their children on you know, public platforms, again, algorithmically charged platforms, is designed for us currently thinking about that realm of online privacy for children. Illinois is now the first state in the country to pass a law establishing earnings protections for minors who are featured in online videos. The law allows teenagers over 18 to take legal action against their parents if they are featured in monetized social media videos and not properly compensated. The new law takes effect July 1st of next year. Wow, brave new world we're living in. We have not begun to I think, unpack that just yet because mm-hmm. right now we're we're kind of hyper fixated on what's coming up um, right now in Congress and how can we play a role at the state and federal level um, pushing larger um, you know protections for kids online. But I think the beauty of what we're creating is it's meant to be sustainable. It's meant to be a youth led coalition that is equipped and that is willing to expand, to add in more voices and perspectives, and through that expansion, look at how we can critically engage in conversations related to protecting kids online from that that perspective of how our kids portrayed at a younger age through parents. Um, But we've not unpacked that just yet.
moving on from, you know, the broader ecosystem, the business practices to your individual experience, how do you currently try to find balance between the physical and digital? The, the best part about this is that we understand what's happening on the back end. And so I personally feel a sense of agency to some degree that like when I'm on Instagram, I know what's happening behind the scenes. And when something is recommended for me, for example, as a suggested post, I know I can turn off suggested posts for 30 days, um, even though I'd want to do it for longer and be able to engage in that process where I'm, I'm an active consumer of content. That's what Emma was talking about with her YouTube consumption. I want to be consuming content that I want to see. I want to be curating my own digital experience. I don't want it curated for me. Um, because when it is curated for us, we see those dark patterns and those rabbit holes take center stage. For me, that allowed me the freedom to engage online in a productive manner while maintaining my physical health, maintaining my mental health, and allowing me to chart my own journey and be agent in my digital experience. Um, so it's just really consciously putting in levels of friction between me and addictive technologies to live the life I want and to meet the, the needs that I have placed and projected for the platform. Um, it really is through self-awareness and through charting my own um, intentionality every time I enter an online app and platform. But with an understanding that there will be shortcomings, there will be falls and there will be slips. But as long as I, I jump back on the horse and continuously lean into um, those goals and objectives and put into place action that I can kind of have an experience that I find of value. Zaman and Emma, thank you both so much for your time and insight. I'm excited about the future of Design It For Us and future of social media, hopefully, hopefully. It's Thank good you. One. Thank yeah. you for having us. And so I guess what I would just like to say to any young person watching this is you might not think you have the power to change the conditions that you find depressing. I think an awful lot of you, well, I'm not even old enough to vote yet, or, or what does one vote matter, or, uh, you know, the system is rigged so that we don't matter. Our history um, shows the opposite. Things get worse when young people don't engage, things get better when young people do engage. And not only do they get better in society, but the therapeutic value of linking arms with colleagues, you can link arms and you can change the world and feel a lot better about the world that you're living in. I realized that m me as a digital native, I have the ability to kind of to explain things from my unique perspective, to, to bring a bit more to the conversation and, uh, and that's, that's found me here today. As the first digital natives, we have the deepest understanding of the harms of social media through our lived experiences. But it is from those experiences that we can begin to build the most promising solutions. You are being robbed of your time and energy when as a kid you should be playing and talking with people and experiencing the world. But in reality, you're stuck mindlessly scrolling, comparing yourself to others, and honestly feeling disconnected. And while there are many benefits of the online world, we are seeing the increasing harms as the youth mental health crisis has only gotten worse. And I'm gonna go a little bit outside my lane here and suggest that we have you and a number of your supporters and members back here. 